You're listening to Natural Resources University. In this podcast network, our hosts are university researchers and extension specialists, opening your gateway to the science of natural resource management. Pond University is your one-stop shop for all things pond management. It is hosted by Mitchell Ziske and Megan Gunn from Purdue University and Illinois Indiana Sea Grant. Join us as we talk with biologists, managers and pond owners about the topics and tools needed to manage your pond for good habitat and great fishing. So grab a notebook and a beverage and sit back and enjoy Pond University. G'day, welcome to Pond University, the podcast for all things pond management. This is our very first episode. Uh, my name is Mitch, I'm one of your hosts, and we also have uh, Megan Gunn here. Hi Megan, how are you? I'm good, how are you? I'm good. So it's pretty exciting to uh, be recording the first podcast uh, episode for this new series that we're uh, developing here. I'm so excited about it. Yeah, no, it's it's exciting. We've talked about it for... Uh, for a few months, we've planned it for probably more than a year, and and we're uh, about to get stuck into it. So, um, in today's episode, we're going to talk generally about the pond ecosystem. You know, is pond is a pond just a puddle or a hole in the ground with water in it, or is there more going on there? And and we're going to get more into that here in a little bit. But I thought a good starting point for this first podcast episode might be to introduce ourselves, uh, tell the listeners a little bit about what we do and what this Pond University podcast is all about. So, um, Megan, why don't you go first? Why don't you tell us a bit about who you are, um, why you're interested in ponds and aquatic sciences, and and um, I guess why you're interested in this podcast. Awesome. So my background um, is in aquatic ecology, so I'm an aquatic ecologist by training, which is why I'm interested in ponds. A lot of what I've been doing for the last seven years has been in agricultural streams and big rivers. So ponds are are not my forte, so I'm interested in learning a whole lot more about them. Um, Right now, I am a student recruiter for our Department of Forestry and Natural Resources at Purdue. I also do a lot with aquatic education with Illinois Indiana Sea Grant. So um, being able to take what I'm learning about ponds here and taking it back to the schools is going to be a lot of fun for me. Great. And so, um, where did you get your uh, degree from? Was that uh, in the Midwest here somewhere? Yes, right here at Purdue. So, I have a degree in Ecology, Evolution, and Environmental Biology from Purdue University within the College of Science. Um, I minored in Fisheries and Aquatic Sciences. So, that is that is how I got involved in the department. You're a Boilermaker then? I am, through and through. <laughs> are you, are you a Hoosier as well? Are you from Indiana originally? I am from Indiana, so I'm from Maryville, Indiana, which is right underneath the Great Lakes. Okay. And how did you get interested in uh, environmental and aquatic sciences to begin with? I think I it was always within me growing up, um, but doing a lot of hands-on things during undergrad really solidified this path for me. I wanted to go into marine science and learn to get really, really sick. Um, seasick and so I went back to stream ecology and it's kind of where I stayed but I love it. Well um, you know streams are not ponds but tell us uh, something interesting about the streams here in Indiana that some people might not know about them. Hmm something interesting about these streams. They're not as dirty as they look. A lot of the a lot of the bodies of water that we have here in Indiana um, are free-flowing and so the sediment never has time to settle and so they look a little brown and murky but it's just that it's just that that sediment flowing through um there's lots of different fish that live in these waters and they are they're amazing yeah i remember the and um not long after i moved to purdue i got the opportunity to go and sample some streams that you know are like barely 10 feet wide and you know maybe knee deep at the deepest and i was amazed that you can find 20 or 30 fish species in these small streams so it was pretty incredible that's my favorite part taking and taking kids out that that look at these bodies of water that look like they have nothing in them and they're they're so surprised it's awesome yeah i've definitely been called a kid more than once here (laughs) recently so that's so i think that fits pretty well 
What about you, Mitch? Where are you from? So, um, you might notice I speak a little funny. Um, I'm not from Indiana and I'm not even from Kentucky, as some people have guessed before. Um, I am originally from Australia. I did a, I got a marine science degree in Australia and I did um, grad school there and worked on fisheries and fish biology. And then in 2014, I moved to Purdue and moved to Indiana. Both my wife and I got jobs over here at Purdue. And, and so that's what brought me to the Midwest and brought me to the United States. Um, and so that was a big transition and lots of things to get used to here. Uh, but it's been a lot of fun. And, and uh, there's obviously not much ocean around Indiana. And so one of the things that I've been working on over the past five or six years is, is getting into ponds and, and understanding pond management and, and helping um, landowners and, and housing associations and um, lake associations manage the ponds that they enjoy using. Do you enjoy pond research? Yeah, I do. I enjoy, um, you know, learning about ponds. I think something we're going to talk more about in today's episode is that ponds can be a lot more complex than they look as well. Uh, you mentioned, you know, some people underestimate streams. And I think a lot of the time people underestimate ponds. They think, you know, they think of them more as a, you know, maybe a fish tank where you've just got um, a little bit of water there and you've got a couple of fish, couple species or something and that's it. But ponds can be quite complex and their processes and the interactions that happen in ponds can be complex and it can be very helpful to understand that if you're trying to manage your pond. So I originally got into marine and aquatic sciences because uh, through my love of fishing. I'm a big fisherman. Um, I fished for as long as I can remember. My granddad used to take me take me fishing when I was three or four years old and I got to fish for some pretty cool species back in Australia, both marine and, uh, and freshwater fish species. And since moving to the US, I like bass fishing, largemouth bass, smallmouth bass, um, and lots of other species when I get the chance to catch them. But a lot of the bass fishing that I do is actually in ponds, whether that be uh, public ponds or ponds of friends of mine. And so uh, that has really driven my passion for better understanding ponds and, and managing ponds for fishing and for fish communities. I think I've been spoiled with electrofishing. <laughs> just there's something about just being able to look at a body of water and zap it essentially and and the fish just come just it is spoiled. Me. Yeah. I know. I, I've definitely had some days fishing where I wished I had an electro fishing, some electro fishing equipment <laughs> with me because apart from singing to the fish, I could not get them to, uh, to jump in my boat. <laughs> <laughs> what will we be covering today? Good question. So in today's podcast is the very first episode. And so we want to give an introduction to Pond University and what it is and what we'll be doing and who we'll be speaking to. And then later in the episode, we have our first guest, and he is going to talk about pond ecosystems. He's going to tell us a little bit about what constitutes a pond ecosystem, what are some of the factors that are important to consider, and how better understanding the pond ecosystem can help us with pond management. So that's the perfect segue into my next question. What is Pond University? Pond University is a brand new podcast series uh, that's going to focus on all things pond management. This includes constructing ponds, managing fish populations, managing aquatic vegetation, and maybe even some bizarre fish species or brand new techniques that people are using for pond management. The, uh, the podcast is going to have episodes come out once a month, and it's actually part of a larger podcast network called Natural Resources University. So as I mentioned earlier, this podcast has been in planning for some time. It's actually a collaboration with universities from across the US and the, uh, each university is going to contribute a podcast series on a specific topic. So some of the other podcast series includes Deer University, Habitat University and Prescribed Fire University. These four podcast series are going to be collected underneath this large podcast network called Natural Resources University. So some of the things we're going to be covering are seasonal topics like how to prepare your pond for the winter or what to do when you're when the ice thaws out in the spring. Absolutely. And we're also going to cover topics like 
uh, pond aeration and how to prevent summer and winter fish kills and things like that. And Megan, who are some of the people we're going to talk with during this podcast? So we're going to be talking with scientists, we're going to be talking with different managers, some consultants, some pond owners, and some of the students that we have here at Purdue. Absolutely, and we're also going to talk to some extension educators and um, pond professionals who do this stuff for a living. And so we're going to hope to provide a really diverse overview and bring lots of different perspectives to the table when talking about pond management. Uh, I really like that you said pond owners, Megan, because I think they can sometimes bring a really unique perspective to some of the issues that, that ponds face in the Midwest, and we might be able to learn some bad news stories or some success stories from them. And so that'll be really great to dig into that a little deeper. And so I guess the million dollar question is, why should you listen to this podcast? Why should you subscribe and continue listening to our episodes? And um, well, number one, I hope it's entertaining. I hope we can provide some entertaining content for you to listen to maybe on your drive home from work or something like that. Um, but another thing, I, I think, you know, we really want to provide the tools for people to be able to manage their ponds on their property. A lot of people that I speak to, they have a pond on their property. Maybe it was there when they bought the property or maybe it's a pond that's just been neglected for a long period of time. And they want to really start using that pond for for things that they enjoy to do, whether that be fishing or swimming or maybe paddling on the pond, even using it to attract other wildlife like birds and amphibians. And, and so that can seem like a really overwhelming process or a daunting task to do if you don't have any experience with it or you don't, uh, you know, or that your pond is in really bad shape. And so uh, I want to, you know, provide tools and materials for, for these people to get a better understanding of their pond, what happens in a pond, what causes some of the issues that they may be seeing. But I also want this podcast to be really practical. I want the listeners to be able to take away tips and techniques that they can use to better manage their ponds. This is going to be an amazing podcast. That may be biased, but I think it's going to be awesome. <laughs> I'm glad you think so. I think so too. I'm really <laughs> excited about this podcast. You know, like I said, there's been a lot of anticipation here, but I'm really excited that we're recording this first episode. Uh, we're probably going to get a lot better at doing this as the, as the podcast goes on. <laughs> I don't know about you, Megan, but I've never, I've never recorded or hosted a podcast before. Uh, I don't think I've ever even been a guest on a podcast. So, I mean, I do talk to myself a lot in the mirror, which probably helps. But um, <laughs> how about you, Megan? What podcasting skills do you bring to this? I have served as a co-host um, a few times on Teach Me About the Great Lakes, which teaches everybody about the Great Lakes, similar to what we're doing right now, but focusing on that bigger ecosystem. Yeah, um, a, uh, some shameless self-promotion there. We'll, we'll <laughs> yeah. provide a link to that in the show notes. Um, well, that's great. So you're the, you're the professional here and I'm, I'm the student learning how to do things. So bear with us and, you know, feel free. Any podcasters out there, maybe you can uh, send us some comments or, or leave us some tips and tricks uh, by contacting us and we might be, that might be able to improve this podcast. Essential Pond Terms, the segment where we hope to expand your vocabulary by defining important terms for pond management. One of the things we will hear a lot about is turbidity. So turbidity in the most basic terms is how cloudy the water is. And that can be impacted by um, a lot of the, the, the substrate, a lot of the substances that are in the water just kind of free floating. And so that can come from the soil around it. Um, it can come from disturbed sediment. So maybe there's a lot of things going on at the bottom of the pond. So that is turbidity. Another thing we will hear about are buffer zones. So buffer zones are these areas between the water and the, the land, the terrestrial portion. Um, and those buffer zones really separate any excess nutrients or excess sedimentation from, from flowing straight into the, to the waterway. And so you get this, you get this collection um, or absorption if they're nutrients. The, if you're using aquatic vegetation, those aquatic vegetation are going to absorb the excess nutrients before they hit the waterway. So another thing we will hear a lot about are stunted fish. And stunted fish can be stunted for a variety of reasons. They could be um, due to poor conditions in a waterway, but it could also be a population that isn't able to grow um, to its full capacity because there aren't, they aren't in the conditions that would allow them to, to do so. 
Well, I think without any further ado, we'll jump into the main topic for this first episode, and that is discussing the pond ecosystem. And to do that, we have a guest, um, Logan Halderman, and he is an undergraduate student at Purdue University. He's majoring in aquatic sciences, and he's recently worked with me over the summer to dive into this issue a bit more and develop an extension publication that we hope to publish so landowners can use this to get a, um, a more insight into the pond ecosystem. So I thought it would be a great place to start uh, with this podcast, you know, better understanding the pond ecosystem itself before we jump into some of these specific topics. And given that this information is fresh in Logan's mind, uh, he should be able to give us a really great overview of the pond ecosystem. I'm excited to hear what Logan has to say to us today. To what he has to teach us today. I'm excited to hear what Logan has to teach us today. Absolutely. The student becomes the teacher in today's podcast. G'day, Logan. How are you? I'm great. How are you? Good. Thanks for uh, joining us for the podcast, and thanks for being the uh, very first guest on our podcast. It's, it's great to have you here. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. And so you're an, uh, you're an undergrad student at Purdue majoring in aquatic sciences. Can you tell us just a little bit about, you know, why you got into aquatic sciences and some of the stuff that you've done in your program so far? Yeah, so oh, I think uh, my dad took me fishing for the first time when I was probably three or four. And uh, ever since then, I've kind of been hooked on, on just fish and aquatic ecosystems in general and, and things like that. And uh, I did my first year of college at Bemidji State in Minnesota, so that was an interesting experience. And then I, I came back home to Indiana and joined the Purdue program. And uh, yeah, it's I've really enjoyed it so far. Um, the professors here are great. Uh, we we get out a lot and we uh, do a lot of hands-on work. And um, yeah. Well, that's a great. Um plug for Purdue University if anybody's interested in <laughs> in their undergraduate programs. But it's funny, Logan, I was talking a little bit earlier about how I got into aquatic sciences and I said I think my granddad took me fishing about three or four years old too. So <laughs> so it sounds like you've had a very similar start there. Yeah. Ever since I can remember. So Logan, not only are you a student within the department, but you're heavily involved in the student chapter of the American Fishery Society. Can you talk a little bit about that experience? Yeah, so uh, AFS is, so we're the student subunit for um, the American Fisheries Society here at Purdue. And we're affiliated with the state American Fisheries Society and then the national uh, American Fisheries Society. and we get to go out and do a, a lot of fun activities and um, we, we learn a lot about different fish sampling techniques and get a lot of experience and then we also do a lot of networking with um, professionals and we visit a lot of, we've gone to state meetings, national meetings um, where people just present research and you can learn a lot from those people and yeah, so AFS has been huge in, in kind of giving a lot of undergraduates uh, a bit of a, a kickstart and um, gaining a little bit of a field experience and research experience and then experience um, talking to uh, real professionals that um, can give you a bit of a boost in your own career. Yeah, that's great. Um, that's a great club. I say so because I'm the advisor of the club, but... But really, the club does uh, does great work. And you reminded me, Logan. Um, in addition to your credentials of it, being an undergrad in the program and and you know working w with me on on pond um, pond extension documents and the pond ecosystem, you uh, helped out with a an assessment of a of a private landowner's pond and actually completed a, a, a report with uh, man management recommend recommendations for them. Isn't that right? Yeah. Yep, so that was, I think that was two years ago now, a bunch of, uh, of us from the AFS club, we all went to Pioca Lake, which is, a, I think it's a, like a Christian camp in southern Indiana, and they have a big, or not, it's a big pond, it's called a small lake, it's about 20 acres, and then we did a bunch of 
fish sampling and uh, water quality sampling and we got a bunch of data and then I got to process all that data and uh, we aged some fish and then we calculated some population indices and uh, evaluated the population and that was a great um, experience for me. It was the first time I'd ever ever done anything like that. So Great. So not only do you know a lot about the pond ecosystem, you are also experienced with giving management recommendations for ponds. Pond Species Profile, the segment where we will showcase the biology and ecology of popular and not so popular pond species. The first species we're going to profile this week is the humble bluegill. Bluegill are one of the most common fish in ponds and, and reservoirs and that's definitely the case in the Midwest. They're one of the recommended species to have in there. Um, they provide important food for larger fish like bass but they also provide great opportunities for people. Uh, kids love catching them, they provide great uh, food fish to eat so they're really a, a common but important part of ponds. Bluegill are part of the sunfish family, so they're related to green sunfish, red ear sunfish, pumpkin seeds, and things like that. Uh, and they grow uh, in ponds to maybe about eight or nine inches in size at their maximum. Uh, more commonly, they're they're between that you know four to six inches in size. They predominantly eat invertebrates, so they'll eat zooplankton in the water column. They will also eat um, insect larvae and insects and other things like that. And the larger um, bluegill will also eat small fish, maybe like uh, small minnows or, or larval fish of bluegill and bass. And bluegill can also eat bass eggs. And so when bass are spawning, you know, they're, they're constantly chasing these bluegill away. Bluegill can grow quite quickly in ponds. They, um, you know, if you stock bluegill at about two inches in size, the next year they can be uh, five five inches approximately. They typically start reproducing within their first year or two and they can live to be um, six or seven years old. So um, the key role for them in ponds is providing food for bass. And so if you don't have appropriate predators in the pond, bluegill populations can become really large. And when they do become large, they can become stunted. There are not enough resources such as food and space to go around. Bluegill typically start spawning when the water reaches about 70 degrees Fahrenheit. So late spring, early summer, they'll, they'll start spawning a little bit after bass. Um, and they spawn by making colonial nests. That is, they build a nest, but they build nests in, in a big group. Um, Megan, I know we have a, a few questions for Logan here about, you know, the pond ecosystem. And, and Logan, we're, you know, we really want to... Um, try and educate listeners about, you know, ponds are more complex than just a, a hole in the ground or a puddle um, and how it, understanding some of that complexity can be beneficial for management. Mm -hmm. And so I guess the first thing to start is, you know, why are ponds important in the Midwest? You know, we, are, are there a lot of ponds? You know, are there only a few ponds who uses ponds? And, you know, why should this podcast even exist? And, and what is a pond? You had just said that it was it was more of a pond than a small lake, or maybe you said it was more of a small lake than a pond, but what, 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 what makes a pond? Yeah. So I, I don't really know the numbers on the amount of ponds in the Midwest, but it's gotta be an insane number, especially when you have all these little farm ponds everywhere. And I think there's a number that I read uh, that was about 40,000 ponds just in Indiana alone. Um, and I don't know how uh, accurate that number is. I think it's a pretty old number, but yeah, there's definitely, there's a lot, there's probably more ponds in Indiana than there are Aussies in Indiana, I'd bet. So <laughs> I'd say so. <laughs> yeah. It is, there's always a question of how you define a pond, right? So like, is it, you know, swimming pool size or are we talking like 30 or 40 acres and, you know, I don't know how they calculate those types of things, but uh, yeah, mo I'd say most of them are probably farm ponds that are on people's properties, and a lot of them aren't aren't managed at all, and they're used quite a bit because I know um, 
it's the number one spot for basically uh, it's the most popular spot to fish in Indiana is a private pond so you know people utilize them a lot and they're really important for a lot of people um, but I don't know how much actual management goes on and there's I think there's a lot of potential that can be unlocked in a lot of different ponds that aren't managed yeah I mean I know that in a lot of larger reservoirs and public waters um, the state is responsible for um, for managing those right and so it's very well defined who manages them and mm -hmm. and hopefully they get some resources to manage those but for a lot of these private ponds you know it's up to the landowner or the homeowners association to decide that they want to manage it and to find the money and the time to manage it and so so you're right a lot of these ponds go unmanaged despite how important they are for people's recreation and and I think you know I, there are probably different definitions on on what is a pond you know based on size or something like that but yeah uh, really it comes down to the you know the size the size of your pond will dictate the different types of management and the different types of fish populations and things like that that you can have in your pond and and we're going to focus on smaller ponds i think in this podcast you know that sort of half acre to five acre sort of size but a lot of what we talk about here is applicable to larger ponds small lakes and even larger reservoirs too so um we might even have some guests on from the department of natural resources that who manage these larger reservoirs and they might be able to give us some tips and tricks for these smaller ponds yeah the same process needs to occur in, in small ponds happen in all aquatic systems. So that's right, and that's a that's a great um, segue into I guess my next question. What are some of these processes that occur in in aquatic systems and ponds in particular? Generally, there there the factors um, of ponds are are divided into two two different groups: biotic, which are living, and then abiotic, which are non living. And the, the abiotic factors are things like sunlight, um, turbidity, temperature, oxygen levels, things like that. And, um, you know, temperature and oxygen are probably the, the most important for sure in, in pond management. They're the main, um, the, the drivers of uh, productivity and just all life in general in a pond and so when you're talking about fish in general um, temperature can control like their activity levels and um, spawning just generally what they're doing at any time and and fish have a each species has a, a, a separate um, range of, of temperatures that are, are good for them for example you have tilapia which aren't going to survive uh, much below 55 degrees or so and then but they can survive up to oh geez 100 110 degree water temperatures and then you have fish like um, commonly in ponds like largemouth bass that you know they can survive up into the 90s and temperature wise but they can also go way down close to freezing so okay and so you know temperature is important for the fish populations uh, but is temperature something that we can manage as, as for our ponds? Like, what do we add an air conditioner to the pond or a or a heating <laughs> element? Like, is temperature something that we can manage in a pond? Yeah, it's, I mean, it can be kind of kind of difficult. Um, so there's no good way to you can't like attach a chiller or anything to your pond, but um, shade can play a big part. So the the structure around the pond, like trees and bushes. Uh, a pond that's mostly shaded is going to maintain a generally cooler temperature than a pond that's, um, you know, just has grass all the way around it and is fully exposed to sunlight. The depth plays a big part. Like a shallow pond is going to heat up much faster than a, a deeper pond. Okay. So if you have a deeper pond with some some trees overhanging it, some shade, then, then your water temperature could be quite a bit cooler in the summertime than than uh, than an open pond that's shallow and, and maybe turbid. Yeah, yep. And the turbidity can play a big role too. So if you have a bunch of sediment and clay particles suspended in the water, they really absorb the energy from the sunlight and they can really increase the water temperatures versus a clear pond where that 
the energy doesn't get absorbed as much. So. Okay. And how might you, you know, if you have a pond that's pretty warm and exposed and shallow and it's also turbid, you know, what are some things you can do to maybe try and reduce that turbidity in the pond? Yeah, so the best thing to, to decrease turbidity is just uh, controlling the, the land use practices around it. So each pond has a watershed, which is the, the area around the pond that basically just drains into it. So if a, a raindrop falls in the watershed, it's going to drain into the pond. And so um, those, those water droplets that drain into the pond can often carry sediment particles, clay particles, uh, things like that and you know cause a lot of turbidity and so the goal is to usually decrease the amount of those particles that are going in there and so things like um, conservation tillage just minimizing the amount of exposed soil and eroded soil in the watershed so i know on the stream side um you can put in buffer zones to to help reduce some of that turbidity mm -hmm. um in those excess substances going into the water is that something that happens with ponds too yeah yeah it's exactly the same the same concept can occur with ponds so you can put buffer strips around of, of woody vegetation or grass works pretty well too and that, those can also control not only sediment but um, nutrients from entering the pond so um, those, those those plants in the buffer strip can tie up a lot of the nutrients that would excess nutrients that would be entering the pond and cause issues as well so yeah they're they're really really important um thing it's it's a really basic thing you can do to make a pretty big difference in the pond what kind of issues what what kind of issues would those excess nutrients cause yeah so ultimately um ponds pond productivity is driven by the nutrients that are in the pond. So these nutrients are utilized by plants and algae that are in the pond. And um, so most ponds in Indiana have sufficient nutrients for those plants and algae to, to grow and do their thing. Um, but oftentimes you get excess nutrients coming in from the watershed or from you know, muck that's accumulated in the pond and you get excess growth of those algae and plants and it just chokes everything out. Um, it can throw off predator-prey relationships in the pond. So if you have a lot of dense vegetation, for example, um, bluegills will often become overpopulated and stunted um, because the bass can't find them in the vegetation. And hmm. you can also have issues hmm. with the, the algae and submerged plants um, when they die off in the fall they, uh, the decomposition of those plants can zap a lot of the the oxygen out of the water which all the other organisms need to survive especially fish and that can cause issues with low oxygen and it can ultimately lead to a, a fish kill okay so you mentioned you mentioned oxygen as one of the most important abiotic factors, and, and you, you mentioned that excessive nutrients and excessive algae can lead to low oxygen. Can you talk a little bit more about oxygen? You know, how, how is oxygen distributed in the pond, and, and how can we manage oxygen in ponds? Oxygen is um, added to the pond over the surface of the pond. So um, as waves or as, as wind blows across the pond, it can add oxygen and also if you're, if you're looking to add more oxygen to your pond you can use an aerator you can use like a, a fountain or some kind of air um, bubbler that uh, add oxygen to the water and so is it is it just the does oxygen just enter through the pond surface or are there other ways that it gets in the pond as well yeah so there are other ways like uh, plants primary producers like plants and, and algae do play a big role in adding oxygen to the water. They're, they're beneficial in that they add oxygen that all these organisms need. So that's how oxygen gets into the pond. Are there things that take oxygen out of the pond? Yeah, so all, all organisms that live in the pond, or not all, but most of them, uh, utilize oxygen in one way or the other. And so you have 
things like um, fish and snails and crayfish and uh, aquatic insects that, that utilize the oxygen that's in the water and, and remove it from the water as they use it. And then you also, the plants themselves that create oxygen during the day can, they respire at night and they can take oxygen out of the water. So that's another thing that can happen if you have excess um, vegetation in the water is that they, they utilize all that oxygen at night and uh, dis or remove all the dissolved oxygen from the water. Okay, so you've got the fish and the crayfish and the animals breathing uh, and then the plants which add, all the add a lot of the oxygen during the day, at night they respire too and will take some of that oxygen out. Yep, that's right. So Logan, what type of biotic interactions or factors are, are going on within these pond ecosystems? So we have, um, everyone knows, so everyone thinks of these, uh, they think of fish when they think of biotic factors, which fish are a big one and they're really important to people. And, but we also have um, biotic organisms like phytoplankton that I mentioned. Um, you have what are called zooplankton, which are these microscopic animals that um, are just kind of floating around in the water eating the phytoplankton. And then you also have organisms like amphibians, like frogs, and occasionally a salamander maybe, turtles. And, and then you also have Animal, terrestrial animals that visit a pond as well, like raccoons, possums, and, and deer, and beavers, and muskrats, and all these things, and they, they all well, interact um, to form a, an ecosystem that's hopefully balanced. Okay, and how, how do they interact? In what ways do they interact? So, uh, ultimately, phytoplankton kind of, um, I would call them the, the fuel of the, eco, the pond ecosystem. So you have uh, these phytoplankton that are they utilize nutrients that are in the pond and they um, they grow and they do their thing and th those are eaten by zooplankton which are these microscopic animals and then those zooplankton are eaten by fish they're eaten by aquatic insects they're eaten by um, amphibians like frogs and um, so you have these these relationships where um, one thing at the the bottom of the the pyramid you would call it usually is is ultimately fueling all of this productivity um, of the the biotic factors uh, above it. Okay, so so these phytoplankton sort of link link some biotic factors. At least they link nutrients to the rest of that those animals. Is that right? Right, yeah, they're kind of the stepping stone from abiotic to biotic. Okay, that's cool. And so do, they, do these biotic things, these animals and invertebrates and stuff like that, do they, do they only interact be, through eating each other or are there other ways that they interact too? Oh, the, yeah, they interact in a lot of different ways. So we have, um, I mentioned aquatic plants before, and you have these, um, these, these plants that provide a lot of structure for different animals to live. They, they're really important for, um, I guess I mentioned before, predator-prey relationships, like, for example, largemouth bass and bluegill. But then you also have um, things like competition between um, these biotic factors for the same resources. So you might have a lot of different things consume zooplankton, like bluegill, uh, red ear, sunfish, um, amphibians, aquatic insects. And all these things are, are competing with each other um, for these similar resources. They might not all eat the exact same things, but there's quite a bit of overlap um, from one thing to the next. And, and they all ultimately um, hopefully make each other sh other stronger and, and regulate regulate each other in the process so no, no organism dominates. So since phytoplankton seem to be the driver of everything, is, is there something we can do to control their populations? Is there, can we introduce them to a, a new pond system or are they just kind of there? Yeah, so they're just kind of there all the time. Um, they go in, in cycles depending on, you know, what the water temperature is like and, and what the sunlight is like and, and what the nutrient content of the water is like. 
and so they have these periodic blooms where they um, can can become really pop populated and you can kind of see them in the water you can't see them but the water turns green from all of the the phytoplankton in the water and and so yeah you can really control um, phytoplankton in the water depending on you know sh how much shade is over the pond like I mentioned trees and, and vegetation before and you can also regulate them with um, how many uh, nutrients you allow in the pond so um, like I mentioned previously sometimes you can you can get issues with too many nutrients um, if you don't have buffer strips or there's some other thing going on in the pond and and uh, your phytoplankton can get out of control and that ultimately can be bad even though you know moderate levels of phytoplankton are great um, but yeah so they're, they're fueled by these abiotic factors like nutrients and, and sunlight and temperature okay so there are usually enough nutrients in ponds to, f to fuel these phytoplankton but what about if you have a pond that uh, you know that doesn't see many nutrients maybe you don't have much runoff into that pond maybe it's an old quarry or strip pit or something like that are there ways that we can promote the growth of phytoplankton yes yeah, so I think I think this is popular in um, I know in the southern US when you have a lot of ponds that are pretty low in nutrients and they have low pH so ponds that are more acidic are generally just um, not very productive a lot of these ponds have, have not very many nutrients and you can add them through um, different types of fertilizers and um, but you know that's something to be pretty pretty careful about in general the average pond doesn't need that kind of thing so you can get a little bit carried away and uh, ultimately do more harm than good okay yeah now I have now you mention it I have seen some very bad examples of fertilization going wrong here in Indiana so oh yeah I bet. in my experience um, most Midwestern ponds uh, have plenty of nutrients and and if you are considering fertilization then it's definitely worth you know reaching out to a consultant or reaching out to an expert in your area to help work through some of those decisions okay so are there ways that we can control some of these other biotic interactions like predation or competition ultimately you can you can kind of control a lot of the the fit the interactions between different different fishes by what you allow to exist in the pond so um, whatever fish you decide to stock um, it's important to recognize that they are going to interact with each other and like largemouth are going to eat bluegill and catfish are going to eat bluegill and um, bluegill and red ear are going to compete to some extent um, and, and then it's also important to to do a, quite a bit of research on on this type of thing on what you want um, in your pond and it's important to keep keep any undesirable species out so there's a lot of species that maybe aren't so good for fishing or um, they can take over um, like green sunfish and bullheads things like that um, that you're generally going to want to be really careful about and do your best to keep those out of your pond for the most part and um, because those for example green sunfish will compete with bluegill and um, that, that's not a good thing they'll, they'll outcompete them they have larger mouths um, and so that's not a, a good thing to have in your pond Mitch, you mentioned that there were specialists to help make some of these kind of decisions. Who are who are these specialists? Like, where can our listeners reach out? Yeah, so um, I think a, a good starting point would be uh, the local extension office in your county. Uh, there are usually extension agents there that specialize in ag and natural resources that they can either directly help you or they can connect you with someone who can help. Um, other local uh, specialists from the uh, NRCS or the Soil and Water Conservation District uh, agents, they can help with some of these questions as well. Uh, and then you, there are quite a few of, there are quite a few companies out there that specialize in pond management. And so if you, it might be worth connecting with them, uh, you know, at least to get a quote on some of their services and, and to have a discussion about pond management. I should probably say that the best starting point is actually our website, which is extension.purdue.edu slash pondwildlife. 
And here we have a whole list of resources to help you with pond management. We also have a list of contacts in each county in Indiana to help you get started. And we also have a contact us page. So if you have a really a question that's really stumping you, you can reach out to, to me directly and, and I can give you feedback on that question. That's awesome. There's a lot of resources that are around. So Logan, you've talked about a lot of information today, you know, in the pond ecosystem. You've really, you know, opened my eyes some some to some of the things that I actually, you know, didn't know about with regards to pond ecosystems. But it does seem pretty overwhelming, you know, if I want to try and make my pond better or, or do some pond management that, you know, increases my fish, um, you know, that information you provide is, is a bit overwhelming. And so what can, you know, what are some of the key things that I can consider if I want to try and manage my pond for, for better fishing? Yeah, I think there are a lot of people um, that are really interested in managing their pond, but they're not really sure where to start. They're kind of overwhelmed. They don't really, um, they might not have the best understanding of, of how a pond works, but I will say that ponds can be pretty complex, um, but there are, you also, you don't need a PhD uh, to have a basic understanding of what's going on and, and what you can do to have a better pond. And um, I would say just um, visit the Purdue page and, and learn as much as you can. There's sort of a lot of great resources there. And, and, and just take a look at your pond and, and, and the, the land around it and, and see, just make notes of what you see. Do you, is the water really turbid? Is there uh, not much vegetation? Are there a lot of small stunted fish? Um, things like that. And, and I would just say take, take little steps at a time to try to manage your pond um, as best as you can. Maybe start um, by adding a, a, a buffer strip around it or um, removing uh, a bunch of stunted fish that don't need to be in there or um, things like that. And, and, you know, ultimately maybe if you don't have the money to, to hire a consultant and you're not a professional, but you, you do the best with what you got and um, you just enjoy your pond. Yeah, I think um, some of the um, most impactful examples of pond management that I've seen have come from landowners who have just taken it upon themselves to educate themselves and try different things in their pond and to connect with the right people. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I really think, you know, a lot about pond management and I think pond management is similar to a lot of other types of management and, and even planning for your retirement and things like that. I think the more that you can think about it and the more that you can prepare and develop a plan and stick to that plan, I think you've got a better chance for success. And if you just look out at your pond that's overgrown and has stunted fish and just wish that things were different, then they're probably not going to change. But, you know, I think it does take a little bit of time, even if you don't, like you said, if you don't have the money to invest in a consultant, but maybe you've got a little bit of time, you can you can spend learning some of these things and trying out some of these practices and you can really see some some dramatic changes to your pond. That's right. I agree completely. So Megan, what is one thing that you've learned today from Logan about pond ecosystems? Well, one thing that I hadn't really thought about before is the, the ponds freezing over um, and how the life that is that is underneath that ice can really be impacted by how much how much oxygen is being used over the course of the winter or how however long it's it's been freezing um so i think after this i'm going to look into how many fish kills actually occur over winter due to to low do um but that was that that kind of blew my mind yeah that's uh you know before moving to the u.s i didn't have to think about things freezing at all <laughs> but now <laughs> i do and uh, my car freezes, my toes freeze, and I guess ponds freeze as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think that was some great information there, Logan. It's really cool to see, you know, to see some of these factors that maybe we haven't thought about before, and particularly how these different factors are connected. And and I think everybody would agree that a pond is more than just a muddy puddle in the ground. It's it, you know, even the most, even the smallest or the most basic pond has all sorts of organisms in it that are interacting with each other. So, 
Logan, do you have any recommendations for our listeners um, regarding other podcasts that they may listen to or books that you, you like to read regarding Pond Ecosystems? What, what has helped you learn? Yeah, uh, lately I've been reading The Founding Fish is the, the title of the book by um, John McPhee. And it's really interesting. It's about American shad and their um, their role in kind of the developing um, United States and and how their their populations have transformed over time and how they've affected um, the United States socially and uh, things like that. But yeah, it's a great read. Uh, I highly recommend it. Well, I I appreciate you taking the time today, Logan. Thank you for joining us. Yeah. Thank you for having me on. Absolutely. Best of luck in your in your undergraduate program, and I'm sure you're going to go on and solve all the pond management issues the world has. So, All of them. <laughs> I'll, I'll do my best. Thanks, Logan. Thanks, Logan. Okay, well, that's it for the very first episode of Pond University. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, it was definitely an interesting conversation with Logan. Um Thanks for joining. If you like the podcast, please hit the subscribe button and spread the word. You know, tell your friends um, about this podcast. You might have uh, friends or family that has a pond on their property that might learn some things. So spread the word. Um, Also, be sure to review the podcast. Leave us a review or a rating. Um, That'll help, you know, spread the word more and and hopefully we can build a, a good listenership here. If you have uh, comments or suggestions for the podcast, if you uh, have some topics that you'd like to learn more about, then please contact us. Our, um, our contact information will be in the show notes and we can, uh, we can hopefully develop that into an episode. And, and um, so we would, we would really appreciate any suggestions for topics or content that you might have. Also, uh, if, you, if you enjoyed this podcast, then please consider subscribing to the Natural Resources University Podcast Network and some of those other podcasts that I mentioned earlier, the Deer University, Habitat University, and Prescribed Fire University. Megan, how did you enjoy the first podcast? I enjoyed it a lot. Um, Logan had a lot of really good information for us. Um, Still a little nervous, you know, being the first first podcast, um, the first episode, but I'm excited to see see how we grow throughout the whole process. but also just just learning so much. Yeah, I agree. I'm excited to learn from the guests that we have on. I'm excited to learn how to be better at podcasting. Um, <laughs> and I'm really I'm really excited to to build a community around pond management and and to really help provide even more resources to to landowners so that so that the topic of pond management and the act of managing their pond doesn't uh, isn't such an overwhelming thing. So for sure. And I can definitely see how it could be overwhelming. So in the next episode, we hope to talk a little bit about preparing your pond for winter. Uh, it's getting cold outside. Winter is coming. And, and uh, you know, we hope that you can learn some tips and tricks to preparing your pond to make sure that it remains healthy and to prevent any fish kills that m- could potentially occur through the winter. Okay, well, thanks everyone for joining and we'll see you all next episode. Cheerio. Bye. Pond University is hosted by Purdue University and Illinois Indiana Sea Grant. Pond University is part of the podcast network Natural Resources University, which is supported by the Renewable Resources Extension Act. If you liked Pond University, then check out the other podcasts in the Natural Resources University podcast network. Purdue University and Illinois Indiana Sea Grant are equal opportunity, equal access and affirmative action institutions. Natural Resources University is funded by the Renewable Resources Extension Act. New episodes are released every Tuesday. For more information, follow us on our social media platforms at nr underscore university.